All right. Um, welcome back. Uh, I'm going to start the class as I start every class, and people who've taken uh, a class with me before will know this and maybe hate me for it. But I'm going to ask what you remember from the last lecture. So write in the chat or raise your hand. I, I don't need to cover everything, but I kind of want to know what you remember, what stuck with you, um, anything? All right, go ahead, Jake. Um, I, when building um, a software system that includes an AI component, the perspectives of the data scientist and the software engineer are pretty different and they're bringing different agendas into it. Mm -hmm. Right, yep, we talked about the different perspectives, what their goals maybe be, um, where conflicts might occur. Anything else you remember? Leo? Uh, so we went into uh, an, an example using a lecture or speaker node transcribing service. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the natural language processing component, how does that in integrate with the other software engineering component of the entire system. Right, and we talked about how that's maybe just one part of a full system, right? A very important part in that case. But yes, uh, we want to look at the larger system. Um, one more, maybe? Anything else somebody remembers? Daniel? Um, yeah, the, the uh, pie graph with the data scientists on the left and the software engineers on the right and kind of wanting to be able to somewhat be in the middle. So like um, being able to say what accuracy means in like a production context. So not necessarily getting the best accuracy, but getting good results um, from, from the uh, consumers while still being able to talk to data scientists about accuracy mm -hmm. in terms. Right, so, so maybe this is, this is a good callback to how I tried to frame the course. So we're going to look at both perspectives, but I suspect that most people want to specialize in one or the other direction. But even then it's important to understand um, the whole spectrum and to talk to each other and be productive in interdisciplinary teams. All right. I had one point where I kind of left up at, at the end um, uh, with specifications and correctness, and I kind of rushed this a little bit, and I kind of want to come back to this and talk about this a little bit more in detail. So let's look at this example again. Um, so here's a mechanism, like let's assume we are doing some graph algorithm, the original scenario was that we're analyzing friendship graphs on Facebook, but it doesn't really matter. And we have some graph library that computes the shortest distance, like how many friends in common do you have or something like this between two people in the graph. And you might call this thing and you might get an array out of bounds exception or you get minus one. And somehow this feels like something is wrong here, right? So. There's a question here, should this happen? What should the answer be? And I just wanna ask you briefly, so for the, for the first case, um, array out of bounds, um, can you just vote um, who says it for it? Who should fix this? Is this the person implementing the method? then vote yes, or is this the person calling the method? Maybe they shouldn't have called the method with these arguments, vote no. Just wanna see kind of your intuition, what should happen here. Interesting, so most people say yes, some people say no. So most people say the method implementation is wrong. Uh, some people say we should not have called the method like this. Um, for the lower example, the minus one thing, can you vote again? Uh, does this change your answer? If you're completely confused, also feel free to vote anything else, like go slower or something. Doesn't really change your answer. All right. I would say, oh. IT already writes, uh, depends on the contract, right? So I would say you can't really answer that question right now. 
right? So you can vote yes or no, and you can have your opinion there, but I haven't given you enough information to really make that decision. Um, and right is right, this, this really depends on the contract. So here are two possible contracts um, for this method, right? So the API documentation that says, um, in the first case, find the shortest path between two nodes. It returns minus one if two nodes are not connected. Right, so if that's the specification, we assume that we're getting an answer in every case and we get minus one if they're not connected. So if these two nodes are not connected and we get the lower behavior, that's correct, right? In this case, actually the method is correct and the person calling this um, provides the right method, uh, the, right oops, the right information. In the second case, um, we're saying the method finds the shortest distance between two vertices, but the method only so is only supported for connected vertices, right? So it essentially says, don't call me if these two things are not connected. If these two things, and you can check whether they are connected by calling a different library first maybe, right? So this essentially says there's a precondition on calling this method. And if we're not meeting this precondition, I mean, essentially anything goes. Right? If we are not meeting that precondition, an array out of bounds exception is fine. Minus one is fine. Technically deleting your entire hard drive and crashing your computer is fine. Probably not what you expect, but um, right. So technically the person calling um, the method is wrong if they don't meet the precondition, right? If the graph is actually connected and you get either of these behaviors, uh, this seems wrong in either case, right? So if we meet the precondition and these things are actually connected, um, then we would argue that the uh, results are wrong. So this helps a lot, kind of having a specification helps a lot to write test cases so you know what the expected output is, right? It helps to write maybe checks where you check the inputs before you, uh, before you use them. Um, it helps a lot with decomposing a system into smaller units, right? If you have an interface, if you know what the behavior of a method is, even if it's not implemented yet, you can kind of rely on this. You can build on, build on this functionality without looking at the implementation, right? So this is typically what in software engineering we use to scale, right? So we decompose a system, we use interfaces. In practice, there are different degrees of formality that we have for these interfaces, right? So in an ideal world, we would have formal specifications. Like in the upper case, I have an example here where you have kind of a mathy notation, computer readable, um, that describes the pre and post conditions. That becomes very hard to describe the expected behavior if you go beyond kind of the bank account example. Um, if you want to do like, like the graph nearest neighbor thing, you could probably still specify, but you, you, you spend a lot of time kind of writing um, in kind of a formal notation what you want. So what we have in practice is often textual specification, like the lower example, which is an excerpt of the Java API library, which essentially says uh, what the method does. So there's a lot of text, it says, um, uh, here are the parameters, here's the expected result, here's also a description of what exceptional behavior is, right? So if you don't meet the precondition of something weird happens. So again, it describes pretty exactly what the method should do, even though you don't necessarily need to know how it works inside. And these contracts or specifications are super useful for a lot of things, as I said before, right? So um, it's really useful to determine like who's at fault to even say something is a bug, right? Something is a bug in the implementation or something is a bug in this part that's calling the system. Um, it helps a lot with testing. Um, and you can really kind of answer these kind of questions like who's to blame, who should fix the code, uh, things like this, right? So what can we rely on? Um, so this is a fundamental assumption between, behind information hiding, behind kind of modularity and decomposing systems. Um, the problem is that when we come to machine learning, it becomes very hard to give a specification, right? It's very hard to kind of say, given an audio file, what should happen? We can give a vague textual specification saying, 
give them an audio file, you should give me the text of the audio file. But that's super vague, right? Um, this kind of assumes a lot of magic. Um, you can do the same thing here. Um, this is like Amazon product recommendations, right? So give me the best recommendations. How do we define what good the recommendations are? Probably we define it even by things that the algorithm doesn't know about, like give me the recommendations that maximize my profits. Right? Maybe I'm only giving a more formal specifications. Give me the recommendations um, to products that people bought that are most like the person that I'm kind of like my own past purchasers, right? So I can give a more precise description. But it's still, it's, when we come back to this, it's very hard to define. If I give you a list of purchases and it gives me a recommendation to figure out whether that's correct or not. Right, whether that's useful or not. Um, kind of to write a specification is kind of hard. Um, and this is just the last example. I, I raced over this last time. Um, this is uh, one more of these societal examples that are discussed a lot. Um, a machine learning is used in um, the law enforcement and kind of by judges uh, to make sentences recommendations. And there's a lot of discussion around bias and whether these things are fair and so on that we're going to talk about later. Uh, but one thing that they do is to predict recidivism. So the idea is to predict whether somebody will, somebody who has been convicted of a crime will con uh, commit another crime in the next two years, right? Because if you, if, they, if you predict that they have a high chance of committing another crime, you may not let them out early or something like this, right? Or set higher bail or set higher requirements. So you kind of want to predict based on some uh, characteristics that you have, like the age, the past crimes that they have, maybe the gender, um, maybe the time served so far to, to make a prediction whether somebody will commit a crime again. And again, it's super hard to even think about what would a specification be here, right? How should I describe this, the best thing we can typically come up with is kind of the idea, here's some data and for people, if people are similar to people who committed a crime in the past, then tell me that they're likely to commit a crime in the past, right? So we can kind of describe how machine learning models should look at data and maybe extract something like this, but it's not clear that the model that we're learning here or the, the behavior of the model that we could specify that well, and that we could specify this independent of any training data. So typically in machine learning, we don't have specifications. And that's actually where, one of, where a lot of problems and challenges come from. We have these components that are sometimes wrong and it's even hard for us to say when they are wrong uh, or whether it's a problem that they are wrong because we typically don't have any clear specifications, right? It's hard to test these things. We'll talk next week about testing and this is, this is challenging to even say what a bug is, what a unit test might look like. Um, so typically we define- Could you a question by Leo? Oh, go ahead. Um, so, so, yeah, I understand it's hard to exactly specify what a machine learning algorithm will do. But from software engineering perspective, I think we can still come up with some pro protocols that require a certain degree of specific specification for machine learning algorithm, at least to make sure the, the system will, will, will work robustly without, uh, without force to a termination or, or force to halt during the mid, uh, middle of running something. Yes. We can still ensure the system works. It just may not work exactly as we desired, but I think the other type of like a less uh, comprehensive specification system should be, should be possible. So, so we're talking a lot about, we're going to talk a lot about what you can do. Um, what people typically do is we can specify partial behavior or invariance. So we can, for example, fairness specification is a good example where you say the system should behave the same for men and women, for example, right? So this is something where you have a partial specification on that system. 
um, you can't really say anything about an individual prediction, but you can still say the, the, the model is wrong with regard to a certain specification that we have. Robustness is another ex example where we say um, the system should not be, we should not be able to fool the system around kind of minor changes of inputs that are close to the training data. Um, what we can also specify is a machine learning algorithm itself, right? So the algorithm like um, decision tree learning that we can specify, we can specify how to get from data to a model, right? The, the learning algorithm, but what the model actually does is only described in terms of the data and the learning algorithm, uh, but it's hard to say what the model that we learn from some data should do about recidivism. Does it make sense? All right. So the reason that we don't have specifications uh, and that we use machine learning is typically correlated. Um, the problem is typically we're using machine learning for problems where we don't have specifications, where we don't know how to do this manually, where we don't know how to write an algorithm with a bunch of if statements and for loops that figures out how to predict recidivism, right? So we don't know, depending on the age and certain priors, what should be the right algorithm to say yes or no, they will commit another crime. We don't really know looking at past purchases what the next purchase should be, right? So we're learning this from data. We're learning some rules that we may or may not understand, right? Uh, transcribing an audio file, looking at kind of the byte or the curve of the audio and figuring out how that should, that should work is super hard. We don't, we have tried this, like all transcription, I think, tries to recognize certain letters or so by certain curves, but that has never gotten us very far. Right? So kind of identifying the behavior that should happen somehow from data is way more effective. This is why we use machine learning. Um, we can discover relationships and stuff that's just way too complex for humans to really write down step by step, right? Or we simply don't know, right? We don't know how to, how to do this with audio, for example. So, um, so typically we learn those rules. And I will talk about this more. In, in my understanding, we're learning specifications. We're learning how the system should behave, except that in most cases, we don't understand those specifications. Right? So we, um, we're learning kind of complex neural networks or something like this that we don't understand. So it, it's really hard, again, to talk about bugs. Um, so we often have this indirection instead of saying exactly how we should determine recidivism, how should we should determine the next uh, purchase. We're often saying, so let's optimize for some indirect goals and then hope that the algorithm does something that hope helps with these goals, right? So we specify an objective, like letting out the fewest criminals that will commit another crime, um, maximizing purchases, maximizing satisfaction of people with their audio transcriptions. Right, so something like this we're typically optimizing for, but we typically don't have a direct specification. If you wanna be fancy about it and use kind of language to sound smart, uh, you can talk about this in terms of inductive and deductive reasoning. Um, so there's this whole description here um, of how deductive reasoning, that's more the mathy kind of reasoning where you start with a theory, um, you have some theory, some logic, you derive something from it based on the theory you're doing predictions, and then you're maybe validating whether it actually holds, right? So that's equivalent to um, kind of traditional, maybe programming where you have some rules, you write down the logic, you implement it, and then maybe you observe that it behaves as you want. Whereas inductive reasoning, that's kind of the sciency reasoning. Uh, you start with data, you start with observations, you observe how gravity works and then you come up with rules, right? If you have enough data, you have some confidence, you're building theories. Um, you can go around uh, the other way. You can use those theories then to do predictions and test whether those theories are worth, worth it, right? But it's two different approaches. This is kind of, you can go far back kind of to, to the theory of science and so on to, to distinguish these two uh, forms of reasoning. 
And as computer scientists, I think we are trained way more with kind of deductive reasoning, kind of the mathy reasoning, right? Where you think about kind of theories, uh, you think about logic, you think about how the algorithm should work, give guarantees of actual correctness, what, right? Where everything is correct or not correct, and you can give a proof for this in the best case. Um, whereas machine learning is much more in this camp of, or is completely in this camp of inductive reasoning. You have a lot of data and you observe from the data, right? So you observe um, and you generalize um, and come up with certain rules. They may not always be the exact right rules, but it's the thing that the data represents. Right? So here's a description of what I just said. Um, and you can think about this as this leads to a shifting in design thinking potentially. Right? So when we're designing software systems that have machine learning in them, we suddenly can't prove the system correct anymore fully. Right? So we're, we're including these components that are built on inductive reasoning. We maybe need to think about this different. We don't have clear specifications anymore. It's hard to even say that we have guarantees right, for correctness or safety or things like this. So we often do kind of best effort things. We try to fit the data and it hopefully works in some form. And we can ask, and this is what we're asking throughout the course, what does it mean for our practices? How, what does this imply when we're decomposing systems and we don't have clear specifications, interfaces between components? What does it mean for correctness, for safety, um, and then for all the steps in the pipeline? So after saying this, I have one more disclaimer here that we kind of say that in computer science and software engineering, we have specifications or we could have specifications. But I've shown you in earlier some of the better examples, even test textual specifications that are often ambiguous. But in practice, I think it's very common that you kind of work with very vague requirements. You don't really have specifications for components and we kind of figure out how to deal with this anyway, right? Kind of having exact specifications and formal proofs of software is something that you do in very small kind of core components with a lot of effort, maybe in airplane software or something like this, but in practice in most of our software engineering, we, we are not in this idealized world, right? We already know how to deal with kind of incomplete specifications and so on. Does somebody maybe have a idea what are typical tactics, strategies, how, what do software engineers do to make up for the lack of specifications in traditional software development? How do we deal with this? That we don't usually have good interface specifications, formal specifications, we don't prove our software. Agile deals with that a little bit with having short feedback cycles and, you know, touching base with the customer frequently yep. to get feedback. Exactly. So this is one of the, I think, one of the most obvious strategies here that we've kind of given up specifying everything up front. A, because we don't know all the specifications up front, the customer will change their mind, right? So it's much more common to work iteratively, maybe with the customer in somewhat agile fashion. And we'll see later that the strategies that come out of this, like A-B testing, testing in production, canary releases and so on, where you, where you don't think everything is right, you test it in production, you just build it and you see how it's working. Those are exactly the kind of things that we see also again a lot in machine learning. Right? So this is the thing how machine learning test systems are also tested in production. So I would argue for a lot of these things, um, that what you see in this course, software engineering for machine learning or AI is not fundamentally different. We're reusing a lot of traditional techniques. It's just that by not, by having these unreliable components, we're often raising the stakes. We have safety issues much more often than in maybe traditional software system. We have kind of things that are hard to test, complicated to build, uh, more often than in traditional system. We tend to have solutions for a lot of these things, but they're expensive and we don't like to use them that much. 
But I would, I would argue is that with AI and machine learning, we're kind of raising the stakes here. We're building actually fairly complicated systems very quickly. We might not notice this very quickly. And it becomes hard for a lot of reasons to kind of test them and deal with them and so on. Does this make sense? All right. With this, I have a block of uh, Vivek. Yeah. I, I wanted to uh, like ask, like moving towards the AI components, isn't the expectations of the clients are changing in a way? Uh, because before they knew what they would be getting at the end of things, but having these unreliable components, you don't really know what would be the end result in that regard. So should they be prepared, more prepared around this part? Or is it like, because software engineers can't do more than they can. So, so you're trying to often use machine learning and AI in parts where you don't know going in whether a system is even feasible. Right, whether you can solve that problem. You sometimes have this with, you have this with traditional software engineering as well, right? So this is what the spiral pro process is for. Um, build the hard parts first and try to figure out um, whether the system is feasible, right? So you often also inc incrementally do this, not assume everything up front. But I think we see this way more, yes. So it's, it's harder again, we, we don't, we don't know often whether it's possible to even come up with a model that works roughly for our goals, yes. All right. So I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about kind of basics of machine learning. And I kind of go back quite a bit because I want to level kind of the playing field. I said I don't assume any machine learning background, right? So I, I wanna provide that. If you are familiar with how to build models like feature engineering, the process learning, this might be somewhat boring. And I don't mind if you kind of come back later or do something else in the meantime. I right? so just want to put this out there. Uh, I think next week might be more interesting when we look into deep learning and maybe some classic AI techniques. And then Thursday, I hope to go much deeper into testing um, that has more of a software engineering component again. Right? So, just want to put this out there. So the idea in the most basic sense is we're trying to learn functions, right? So machine learning is um, learning a function from some inputs to an output. And you can do this for many different things, right? So if you're detecting cancer in an image, your input might be all the pixels of the image and the output is yes or no, is there cancer in the image? Right, if you're learning, if you're transcribing an audio file, uh, this gets kind of complicated, but you're, you're taking a chunk of audio and you're predicting what's the next word that should come, right? So you're typically predicting one word at a time or something like this. Um, if you're detecting spam, you take the text of an email, maybe pre-processed in some form where you look at what are the words or the word frequency, some encoding, that th those are the inputs, X1, X2, X3, and so on, right? And you're predicting spam or not. And you can do this for all kinds of things, right? And in the end, what we're always learning is some sort of function, right? And this is where ideally we would have a specification of what the function does, but we don't, right? We want the function to behave somewhat like the data. And in this part, I'm talking mostly about kind of supervised machine learning, right? So an example that I want to use a little bit more um, is you're trying to predict the price of a house um, sale, right? So this is something if you have a, a real estate kind of company, you might want to know um, how should I price a house, right? Or what's the value of my house? Zillow does this, that if you, if you look at your own house or neighborhoods, they will tell you what's, what's, what's something worth, right? And you take some information like the size of the house, the number of rooms, what kind of neighborhood is this in, and make a prediction, right? So that's one sort of function that we might want to learn. And we tend to do this by kind of generalizing from the data, right? So if we look at supervised machine learning, what we do, and I don't want to get much more mathy than, or mathy notation than this is, um, we have a bunch of data labeled data uh, points 
So these are the values for specific houses, for example, that we have seen, right? So uh, let's say we have 50 houses that we know about. The first one has one room, the second one has five rooms and so on. Uh, so each row of this is one house and the attributes of that house. And we know the outcome, right? So we have labeled data, so we know what the outcome is for that specific training data. So we know what the price was for that specific house. And now we want to learn a function that somehow fits this training data, right? So if I feed in those values, it should kind of represent, compute the same results, but it also should generalize to other data, right? So it should not just work for the things that I've learned it from, that I fit it from, but it should generalize to some form. And that's kind of a hard notion what it means to generalize, and we'll talk about this a little bit. Oops. So for the housing data, this might look something like this. There's a famous data set that I use kind of Boston house prices this is a couple of decades ago, but um, this is mostly about the neighborhoods. So it describes the crime rate, the typical number of large, or the percentage of large houses, the percentage of industry lots. So kind of things that you can gather as data about these neighborhoods, the number of rooms in the house, and then the price. You can just, this in the US this is public, right? So you can just look up past sales and if you can find some information about those houses, you have the data and you can essentially collect this data. Maybe as a, as a sidestep, so the most common data structure that you see when you're actually implementing this are tables and they're typically called data frames these days. Um, data frames contains rows with data, right? So every row, like this is, this would be a table. Every row is one house or one kind of description, right? So the first attribute is one, the second attribute is overcast and why the outcome is true or false in this case, right? So this is typically how we represent data. Um, this is not a matrix because different columns can have different types. Right, so you see this here that some columns have strings as types, some have integers, some have booleans. That's quite common. Um, and typically you have a lot of rows for all your data sets. Um, and now you're trying to learn something. And there are a couple of different learning algorithms. And um, honestly, I don't really want to talk. Let me skip regression and go straight to decision trees. Right, so I want to talk more about decision trees because I think they are one of the simplest form to understand how learning works. If you took introduction to machine learning, this is all obvious and you've probably implemented something like this. If you've only done applied machine learning or haven't seen machine learning at all, you may have used some of these out of the box without thinking about how they work internally. So I wanna talk a little bit about how they work internally, how they come up with the decision tree so that you have an idea of how this works and how this relates to overfitting and underfitting. Right, so in the end, what you want to do is you want to build a tree, for example, for the housing data set that figures out if the size, is, look at the size first, if it's smaller than a certain thing, look at the age first, uh, next, if the house is younger or older than something, here's the average price for a house in this category. Right, so it's fairly straightforward to understand these. This is something that we as humans might also use. This is kind of an algorithm. You can write this as if else statements, right? That's an algorithm. And the question is, if we have some data, some labeled data, how can we up come up with a tree like this, right? So how does learning work? So I'm going to use kind of the hello world example for decision trees. Um, because it's really simple and, and easy to look at. Um, this, is, this is ancient. This is um, predicting whether, it's, whether you should go play golf for some reason, don't ask me why, right? So it's kind of looking at the weather forecast, at the temperature, at the humidity and whether it's windy and then whether people went out to play golf or whether they decided they should go play golfing, right? And what you want to do is come up with a tree and you want something like this in the end, um, where it says um, whether you should go golfing or not, right? So this tree fits this data fairly well. This data is really simple, small, right? So it, when, you, when you look at this, um, like when it's overcast, 
the answer is mostly yes, right? So here are all the rows where it's overcast. And in the original data, it's almost always yes to go golfing when it's overcast, right? When it's, when it's rainy, you might want to look at the humidity next, right? So if it's high humidity, then the answer is eh, for some reason, no. Um, and if humidity is, if it's normal, then you go most, mostly golfing, yes. Make sense? The question is, how do we learn this? And I want to walk through an implementation because I think this is, this is actually interesting. Unfortunately, so I, I wrote this like two weeks ago and then I looked at this before this class and I figured I should probably have documented this more or cleaned up the code a little bit more. So you kind of have to bear with me. And this is Scala code. So I'm not sure whether it's easy for me to write. I'm not sure whether it's the most easy for you to read. So I'm just gonna explain this, right? So the first part is just load the data set. So I have the golf data set here, which is essentially what I've shown you before, right? Uh, this also has numbers, but I'm gonna take them out for a second. Um, so I'm just loading the data set so that I have X and I have the corresponding Ys. Right, so if I run this, I should see the table, I think. Because I've written this from scratch in Scala, I didn't have data frames, so I have some implementation to, to do my own data frames. And wow, this is slow. I kind of feared that this might happen. Uh, this is compiling. That's the benefit of Python. You don't want wait for a compiler. Come on. So nothing has happened yet, right? So I just loaded the data that I've shown you in the table before, and it's listing the corresponding output, right? So the first row was true, the second false, and so on. Again, nothing has happened yet. So now we want to build a tree, right? So the tree that I want to build has the following shape. I have this down here somewhere. Uh, where is this? Uh, crap. Come on. So I have a tree that consists of nodes and the node is either a decision or an outcome in my implementation, right? So an outcome means yes or no, go golfing or not. And you see later, I have some confidence behind this as well. So I, I know maybe with 90% chance, I'm confident that I'm going golfing or with 10% chance. And I have a decision. And decision has a left or right node. This is how you can kind of go down in a tree, right? You can have recursive structures and it depends on the predicate. So if you look at this, and I, I'm gonna build binary decisions, um, so windy, yes is a predicate and then I have left branch where it's windy, yes. And I have a left branch where it's not windy, right? And the round bubbles, those are the, uh, the outcomes. So when I'm starting with all my data, I can make a single decision that just represents the most likely outcome, right? If I, if I don't split anything, I will just have yes or no and to make the yes or no decision, I just report what's the most likely outcome in this. Um, I actually, let me see, I, I have a method for that. Um, split outcome. Oops. So if I'm running this, it should tell me what the most common outcome is. Okay. I think this code was not particularly readable, but uh, it's just, come on. Yeah, it's, it's just counting um, whether the true nodes are more common than the false node, then it's true, otherwise it's false. Right, so that's a decision, yes or no. And then I have a decision where I'm counting 
um, the true nodes or the, the more common node versus all nodes. That's the confidence that I'm reporting, right? So in this case, what you're going to see here is um, true is a more, more common outcome. And in 62% of all cases, it's true. So this is what you see here is that in the last column, yes, is a more common outcome, right? If I don't build any tree, I should just always say it's the most likely outcome that best fits the data is that I always go golfing, right? And if I'm doing this 61% uh, of the time, I'm going to be correct on this data set, right? So this is what this says. I'm just looking at the more likely outcome. And I wanna say, what's my confidence that this outcome is correct? So now to build a tree, I kind of want to split the data set in some way. I want to start with a single node. And I kind of need to figure out how I'm going to split this, right? So I need to decide um, what's the decision that I'm going to make and which is the best decision. So there are two parts that I need to do. Um, I need to figure out what are all the possible decisions. This is part one. And then I need to figure out out of all the possible decisions, what's the best one, right? So the first step is let's figure out what are all the possible decisions. In this data set, it's kind of annoying, but it's, it's discrete data, right? So uh, for Outlook, I could have a decision, Outlook is overcast, Outlook is rainy, Outlook is sunny. I can also have a decision, Outlook is overcast or rainy. Out Outlook is rainy or sunny, right? So there are different combinations that I can try. Um, the way that I implement it is, is that I take a list and I kind of sp split this in, I essentially do a smaller than on this list, right? So I say overcast or rainy and sunny, or I say rainy or sunny, um, anyway. And I do this for all columns. Like for humidity, no, for windy it's easy, it's just true or false, right? For each column I have a decision. Let me just do this and again run this and should probably really do this in a different language that compiles faster for a demo. Um, or do this on a faster machine. Like this laptop is really slow for this. All right, here we go. So these are all the decisions in no particular order that I have. The temperature is hot or windy is false or the outlook is overcast or rainy or the outlook is overcast, right? So I have overlapping decisions, that's fine. I wanna see which one is the best. Um, I have temperature is hot or cool. I have humidity that's high. So you see decisions for each possible column and for a specific column, you might see multiple possible decisions. Make sense so far? Now I want to know which is the best, best decision of those to make. The way to decide, there are many different ways to decide this um, and different approaches to different things. But in a nutshell, what I'm trying to do is I want to find the decision that best sorts my outcomes into yeses and noes. Right? What's the decision that best sorts all the data so that all the yeses are together and all the noes are together? There's not going to be a single decision that exactly splits this, right? but there's one that makes, does it the best way. In the specific kind of ancient algorithm that I've implemented, ID3, um, this is based on entropy and information gain. So this is some specific notion of, um, um, of information knowledge. Like if you have a list of just ones, there's very, this is very different from randomness, right? So there's a lot of information, whereas this, if, if this is all mixed ones and zeros, then you have very little information. Um, I don't want to talk about this too much, but the idea is that you measure the entropy in this sequence of ones and zeros, 
So this is defined by taking, um, determining what's the percentage of truths, what's the percentages of zeros, and computing the percentage times the logarithm of the percentage. And honestly, I don't know why, um, but you can look at the textbook and that's what's happening, right? And then you define an information gain that essentially just says, um, if I'm splitting the data with a certain predicate, what's the improvement in entropy overall? And again, the, the details of the implementation doesn't really matter, right? I'm, I, I just have a mechanism how I can figure out how good is a decision in splitting my data into trues and false, right? And what I'm going to do, and that's the main part of the learning part. So in my learning function, what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out for all predicates, I'm computing the gain of the predicate. So there's a for loop in here that's kind of hidden and I'm taking the one with the highest gain. I should have really written the code in a more readable fashion for people who are not immediately reading Scala code. Um, anyway, trust me that I'm just trying all possible splits, right, on the data set and I'm picking the one with the highest gain and then I'm just splitting my data with the best predicate. And I'm creating a tree that has the left part and the right part. Let me just show you what this would look like. Right, so, so the idea here is really take all the predicates that I have all the possible decisions, figure out which one is the best, and then just split it based on the best one, right? And then for each part tree, I just fix again, find the best outcome with the confidence. This would be the first step. Uh, maybe you should run this before I start explaining things. All right. So what we find is that splitting by humidity first into everything with humidity high, the average is false. My confidence is not great, it's near random. But if humidity is not high, then it's pretty good. I, I almost always go, go golfing with 56% um, chance, right? So the humidity split is actually the best one. So I can't, come up with a small tree and the small tree is gonna be better than if I just say, always go golfing, right? Once we have this, from here it's essentially straightforward. We just do this recursively, right? So we have a left group and a right group. And for each of those, we can split again. We can look at all the predicates that we haven't tested yet. So the, the learning algorithm, and this is, I comment out here, oops. Um, it's actually recursive. Uh, let me just run this while I'm explaining this. So after I do the split, I recursively call this to run another split. Right, so both on the left-hand side or the left axis and the right axis, I'm going to split again. And I'm going to split it again and again and again. And I'm gonna stop splitting in the worst case when all the decisions are true or all the decisions are false, or I have no, no predicates left to split. Right, so here's a tree, what would happen if I do this? Again, I start with humidity first. Then the next be best um, decision is to look at the outlook. In this case, then if it's windy, and then if the temperature is nominal, and then I'm, I'm finding this is true, right? Um, I should go golfing actually in both cases. Um, if the outlook is false, I'm gonna go golfing yes or no based on the outcome. And this is, yeah, this is one tree that best fits the original data. Actually, I've split it so far that my groups in the end are almost always exclusively just true or false. 
Right? So there's one single case here, and I'm gonna talk about this in a second, but otherwise my confidence is always one. So this means that in this tree, and let me just show this, I have a slide for this. Um, so in this tree, which is the one that you just saw, um, if I look at this, um, let's say uh, not, humidity is not high, it's not windy, so humidity is not high and it's not windy, then the answer should be yes, right? So normal humidity, not windy, yes. Normal humidity, not windy, yes. Normal humidity, not windy, yes. So in all those cases, it's always yes. I actually have perfect confidence and there's no reason to split this further, right? Because all the cases are already true. Does it make sense? What you've seen now is one form of decision trees, how they work, right? So they recursively split the data into smaller and smaller data sets that are more and more pure, right? So they are all yes or all no's in the ideal case in the end. What you're also seeing here is that I'm overfitting on the data. I'm representing exactly the original data set or almost exactly the original data set. I'll talk about this in a second. So we, we find a tree that very well ex explains the data with very few decisions, right? We're kind of compressing the table into a decision tree, but it's not obvious that this will generalize to unseen data very well. That's something that we still need to evaluate. The earlier trees that I show you where I don't repeatedly split Right? They also work, but they're not super confident about their results. And this is what you typically call underfitting. So they learn some concepts, but they're not very detailed. And one parameter that I can change here to control this is how long do I let the tree grow? Right? How deep does it go? Um, in this case, I just cut this off after a single decision. In the, in the previous case, I let it just run until all the things can't be split any further, right? Either you don't split them because they are all true or all false or because I don't have any predicates left that would improve anything, right? Because they're all in the same group. Um, so if I don't, if I have very shallow trees, I usually don't learn a lot of information. I have kind of weak predictions. That's often called underfitting. And if I, let it learn forever. It will represent the original data as well as it can, but I'm not sure that it will generalize particularly well. What you see here is that I have this one parameter to control how long it's learning, right? So that's something how I can control, it's often called the degrees of freedom coming from kind of statistics of how much things it can learn. Um, and that's maybe one thing to, to talk about terminology here. And I think this is one thing that's to a software engineer is really confusing. Um, there are a bunch of these terms in machine learning that are kind of unintuitive from the outside. So people talk of hyperparameters and model parameters, and they mean weird things. Um, in machine learning, the model parameters are the values that you see in the decisions. So deciding that this decision should be humidity high, that's a parameter of the model. From my perspective, that's a weird term. I don't know who was drunk when they named this. It probably makes sense in some context, right? To my, from my perspective, that's a constant in the model. That's a decision, right? A value, a magic variable, if you want. Um, it's a, it makes sense in the sense that if you think of the model as something that has all these things that need to be learned, right, then all of these are parameters of the model and you learn the parameters of the model. If you think of linear regression, um, I had this earlier, wait, um, no. Uh, if you think of linear regression where you're fitting a function like this, um, then alpha and beta are the parameters of the model. Those are the terms that you're learning. Um, right, the so terms that you're learning in the model, those are called parameter and models may have a few parameters or with deep learning, you have millions or billions of parameters. 
and the parameters, the, the, the things that you use to control the learning process, like when do I stop, those are called hyperparameters. To me, th those would be called parameters to the learning process. Um, but since I already used the term parameters, I assume they picked a different name and call this hyperparameters. Right, so this is terminology that you see a lot and that's useful to just uh, remember um, and to use this way is that whatever parameter you're using in the learning process, like the maximum depths of a decision tree, right? Or the minimum support, which I haven't talked about, right? These kind of things where you decide how long are you learning? How many degrees of freedom are you putting into the model? Uh, in deep neural networks, what architecture you're choosing? Um, those are hyperparameters, right? They influence how the model is learned. And in the resulting model, these decisions, these are parameters, right? Possibly also these if you have some linear things in there. And if you hear somebody talking about degrees of freedom, that roughly represents how many parameters do you have in the model, right? So how many decisions can the, in how many places can you tweak the model to learn something or learn something else? So far so good? Any questions? All right. Let me skip this. There's lots more on decision trees. Um, if you want, uh, I also encourage you to implement your own decision trees if you want. Um, there's an option to do this in one of the homework assignments uh, later, but it's up to you. Faiti? Uh, I'm just a bit confused with the degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. So in the last slide, it says degrees of freedom roughly represents mod model parameters, but, yep. the, but the things we control are the hyperparameters, right? L like as a user, when you're tuning the algorithm, you control the hyperparameters. Yeah, and with the hyperparameters, you often control how many degrees of freedom the model has, right? So for decision trees, you can decide you have a lot of like a very deep decision tree, then you have lots of parameters, or do you have very shallow decision trees and you have very few parameters? Okay, so whatever decision we make for the hyperparameters indirectly influence the kind of model parameters that, the, yes. that are learned. So not the value of the, or indirectly also the value, but also how many you have of those. Okay. Right, you see this next week also with deep neural networks. Um, uh, the architecture, like how many layers you have is a hyper, is a hyper parameter. And then each layer has a bunch of parameters. So by deciding how many layers you have, you influence how many, uh, how many parameters you have, right? So you're influencing typically, there are a bunch of things that you can influence with hyper parameters, but the number of parameters or the degree of freedom is often one of them, All right? Yeah, thanks. All right, um, let me see. So hopefully what you have seen from this is that learning in general, machine learning, supervised learning tries to learn a function by fitting the data. I, I think decision trees are one of the easiest things to understand. That's why I try to explain this in a little bit more detail. And I think it really helps to understand one of these examples to get a sense of what these hyperparameters do, for example, right? So that there's really a decision of how deep the tree is and that influences of how exactly you fit the original data. Okay. Um, you're trying to generalize, um, you know, the, the kind of stuff that we just did generalizes to other outcomes. So you could just uh, present numbers. You can also have different kind of decisions um, so if you have numeric numbers, you would have something like the decision is A is smaller than 10, A is smaller than 12, A is smaller than 15, right? So you kind of need to pick what the decisions are. There are lots of different things. You almost always have these hyperparameters, right? So we had the tree height, the maximum tree height, um, and then many decisions that kind of influence the model qualities, right? So if you have deeper trees, it takes longer to learn. If you have more data, or it also becomes bigger models. They might be more accurate, but also overfit. Um, I think that this. Um, decision trees are nice because they scale pretty well, 
but they are pretty prone to overfitting. There are a couple of strategies to kind of random forests, for example, to have multiple decision trees that are a bit different and averaging them out. And decision trees are also nice because they're easy to interpret, right? So if I show you this result here and I tell you the prediction was false, I can tell you it's because it was, over, it was not overcast and it was this and this and this, right? So I can kind of understand how the model came to this decision. I don't necessarily understand where all these parameters come from, right? So I don't really necessarily know why the tree has built the tree exactly like this, but once I see the tree, I can kind of understand what's, what the algorithm is internally. Right, and this is where we come back to specifications. Um, so we never give a specification of when to play golf, right? So we don't say implement it like this, right? Like a lot of if statements, um, this kind of is a specification in the end and I can implement this in code really easy, but what's the point? I can just generate this, right? The model, I already have this. So also we don't expect perfect predictions. And one thing where you've seen this is when we're learning this value here, like if it's humid and the outlook is overcast or rainy and it's not windy and the temperature is hot or cool, then yes, we go golfing, but not always. And there's actually, if you look at the original data, you have this thing here, where you have three rows that are all the same parameter wise, but they have different outcomes, right? So one day you went golfing, one other day you didn't go golfing. There is no algorithm in the world that could predict this, right? Because there's no way to distinguish the different cases where we went golfing or not. So the best thing that we can do is say, if that's a condition, then most of the time you're going to go golfing. And I'm not super confident, but there's a, like a 60% chance that you go golfing, right? And then if you predict you're going to go golfing and somebody doesn't, calling that a bug is kind of problematic, right? Because I mean, we accept some mistakes. We even accept some mistakes in the training data, right? We don't have perfect things. Um, so we're looking for models that are generalizing well, that are describing the reality well, or that are just plain useful in some sense, right? But we typically don't have, we don't expect that if overcast and it's hot and it's humid and it's not windy, then yes, you will always go golfing, right? So we try to find to approximate something. All right, how far am I going? I might not get to notebooks today. Um, but let's talk about evaluation. I talked a little bit about whether a model is good or bad, um, but I wanna talk a little bit more about how to evaluate this. And the normal metric here is accuracy. And accuracy essentially just checks how many predictions out of all predictions were good, right? Co correct predictions versus all predictions. So when I look at the golfing data, how, many, how often have I said you're going to go golfing versus how often did you actually go golfing, right? How many of those were right? So the algorithm here is straightforward. You just say, well, there's a total number of data points and I'm counting how often am I correct? So if whatever I'm predicting from the model, right? So I'm predicting a result here when the result corresponds to what I expected on some known data, right? Then I'm counting it's correct. And in the end, I'm just dividing the correct count by the entire number of data points. So accuracy is only defined on labeled data in this case, right? So I have some data where I know what the correct outcome is. So I can compare the predictions against the correct outcome. There are a couple of different metrics and we're going to talk about this later, um, how you do this better with numbers and stuff like this. Um, but accuracy, first of all, is just looking for a specific data set. How well am I predicting this? Right. And you can predict on different data sets. So one thing that you can do is you can predict on the data set that you're learning from. Um, let me see. So if I look at this model, if I look at all this data, so I'm learning from all this data, 
and I'm predicting play. So play is the thing that I've learned and then I'm predicting it again. This model here is actually fairly confident. It has learned all of this. So we'll predict everything correct except for this single row. Right, so this is a problem that we just talked about that this single row I can't predict because I don't have any way to distinguish this. So I have, I don't know, 20 data points and only one is incorrect. So very high accuracy. Right, but that's accuracy on the training set. So what I've just figured out is how well does my model explain the data that it was trained on. Right, so this model, for example, is pretty poor on the training set. I don't have the numbers here, right? But if I look at, I just look at humidity high are all those, and I can check humidity high. I'm predicting if humidity high is always false, right? So this is wrong, I predicted this wrong, this I predicted correctly, this I predicted wrong, this I predicted wrong, I expected false, but it's true, right? Or no, I'm predicting true and it's, this is correct, actually. Um, anyway. I can go through this and check which of those lines are um, correct or not, right? And the accuracy of this model will not be very good, right? It's underfitting, it doesn't fit the data pretty well. Whereas the accuracy of this model was really good. But again, I'm just looking at the accuracy on the training data, right? So I'm just looking at how well does a model memorize the training data essentially. It doesn't tell me how well it's generalizing. So the way that we measure generalization is we need to test it on unseen data, right? We need to test it on data that the model has not been trained on, but the unseen data also needs labels. So I can't just ask arbitrary values. I need to know what the correct outcome is. And the way that this works typically is that we split the data set, right? So let's say we take all those rows. I mean, this is, they are sorted, so this, it's not a good idea here, but let's take, we take all those rows, we learn a model on this, and then we evaluate the model on the other rows, right? And by doing this, we can test how well does a model explain things that it hasn't seen. Does this make sense? This is really important. We need to be able to split training and validation set we can evaluate on the training set that gives us some indication of how, how well the model fits the training data. But what we really care about is the accuracy on the validation set. Right? So this is typically how code looks like in machine learning libraries. You have all data and you split it in some form into training data and validation data. And there are different ways of splitting this, like 80, 20% is a common way. Um, there are a bunch of other strategies. And then you can get two accuracy numbers. You can get accuracy on the training set and you can get accuracy on the validation set. This is how you detect overfitting. Um, what you expect is that if you give a model more degrees of freedom, the blue line is um, training accuracy. The model should get better. So in this case, uh, it's error. So it, this should get lower, right? So over time, if I, have a, if I have a tree with just one level, one decision, it's pretty bad. If I give it two decision, it will fit the training data better, right? Until it kind of explains most of the training data. So what I would see is if I give more degrees of freedom into this direction, then more and more um, my accuracy on the training data should improve, right? It actually shouldn't really get go worse over time. At some point, it doesn't get much better anymore, or we have already split everything. Um, so it levels off at some point, but it shouldn't get worse over time, right? And what you typically see is that up to some point, the accuracy on the test or validation set works better because we're learning more concepts. And at some point it gets worse. And that's the point where we start overfitting. So at some point we're just learning kind of random noise in the training data. We're no longer learning kind of the concept, but the random noise in the training data, um, and it gets worse and worse over time. 
I can show you this um, in this small implementation. There's not a lot of data to, to deal with here, but um, let us see, I have this somewhere in here. Um, <laughs> so what I'm doing here is I'm splitting um, into a train and test set, as I just described. This is 80-20 split. Um, then I'm learning a model that's Say I'm learning this up to level three, then I'm predicting this and I'm getting a value. And this is the thing that I can't easily just run multiple times, I guess. Let me, yeah. Um, I have a different thing that I can run in a second, um, more efficiently. Should probably do this. Let's see if we'll, um, okay, I'm learning I can't demo on this computer. Um, let me just do this a bunch of times at different levels of depth. So if I'm training, what I did here is I got perfect accuracy on the training set in this case, and I got 25% uh, accuracy on the test set, which wasn't very good. Right? So let me just repeat this. Now with different levels. Come on, come on. There we go. So the first iteration is not that great on the training set, but it's 50% on the evaluation set. Um, the next iteration is getting better, it's also getting better on the test set, right? So we're learning more concepts, we're learning more of the structure in the model. It doesn't get better here and it gets much worse on the test set, right? And then it gets better again. And here we see an effect of randomness because we're randomly splitting. In this case, we were lucky um, that it's actually doing quite okay on the trust test set. If I, probably what I should do is not change this every time. Should have prepared this, I guess. Um, all right, one more time, I can do this. Um, seven more minutes, come on. All right. So, what? Okay. This split for some reason got better. Um, we may have just been lucky. I would need to debug this, sorry. All right, um, this works better in a second. So one thing that we do, like in this case, we have very little data to evaluate on and training is really fast. Um, so kind of taking off 20% of the data is kind of annoying. And then we have a single split and you already saw if I split this in different ways randomly, I get different results. So one thing that people often do in practice is cross validation where they try different test and validation splits, right? So they essentially, instead of validating it once, like, oops, um, in, this, uh, in this case, we have a single split right, and we get one result. What we're doing instead is repeatedly split this, repeatedly split into training and evaluation set, evaluate on the, evaluate, uh, train on the training set, evaluate on the evaluation set, and then repeat, 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 and report the average. So let's say we're splitting 80-20, but instead of doing it once, we do it 10 times, 
And then there are different splitting strategies. So the common ones, the most extreme one is that you train on all data except one data point. And then you're predicting the single data point that you haven't trained on. And you're repeating this for every single data point. Right? So if you learn on everything else except this one data point, um, uh, you, you predict your average over all the accuracy. Like you see how often you get this one data point correct. Um, if training is more expensive or we have too many data points, you don't want to do this evaluation thing like 20 million times, right? So the more common thing then is k-fold cross-validation where you just partition the data into k partitions, let's say 10, right? So this is what you see below there. Uh, this is partition in three. You split the data into three equal parts and each time you take all partitions except one for training and the remaining partition for testing Right, so you have, uh, you have um, k different uh, rounds and then you average over the results. Or you can just repeatedly randomly sample, right? That's often called Monte Carlo simulation or something like this. And that I actually have implemented. So, and that I think shows more stable results, except I don't know whether this data set is again weird. Um, so cross validation is, Come on. It's relatively simple. I just say I have a certain number of rounds. So in each round, I do a split with a certain ratio that I've given. I train the model. I predict these two values. Well, uh, I, I keep the evaluations and then just, I just, from all the rounds, I'm reporting the average. And when this actually executes at some point, I hope that also in this data set, we eventually see um, the effect that I plotted earlier. What? What just happened? All right. Uh, still too random, this data set is crappy. Um, what you see here, there's this, the first round, it gets better over time, the deeper the trees are. And again, you see that Quality goes, nah, you don't see much. Um, but quality spikes around two or so and then goes down. This data set is just stupid. Um, I have another data set here, the Titanic one, but I don't have time to split, switch, I think. Um, I want to do one more thing. Um, if we do this cross validation thing, right? So this is fairly useful to get the, the real result. Can we still overfit? Is there still a chance that we can overfit on the training data, even though we tried different subsets? Has somebody seen this in a, in a class? Can, can somebody explain why this might happen? Righty, do you want to explain or do you have a question? Yeah, so like if the uh, the whole set of data set is comprised of different subpopulations and uh, our training data set contains only a subset of that, like if there are like 10 groups of data set and we train only on eight, then it will perform badly on nine and 10. Which you, so, which you have just seen, right? So, um, but if you do cross validation, we just repeat this over and over again, right? So that shouldn't happen there. Um, in the interest of time, let me kind of go a bit quicker. So um, what happens is that you often use um, this for this kind of testing for and cross validation for hyperparameter tuning, right? So if I, if I do what I just did here, I can look at this and I can figure out, oh yeah, um, depth of two for my tree, that's the best value. By doing this, I made the decision I made the decision to pick the hyperparameter two by looking at the test data or at the validation data. And if I'm doing this, I can fit overfit by picking the model that best fits this data set. So what people do if they do hyperparameter tuning, right? So this is the algorithm for hyperparameter tuning where you essentially just say you have a bunch of candidate parameters and you do the evaluation over and over again until you find the best model. Right, on the validation set, then you're overfitting. Um, the, 
the way to um, avoid this is to split the data into three parts, into training, validation, and test data. Right? So you use the training data to build the model. You use the validation data to do a first evaluation and figure out what the best hyperparameter is. And then only once you're done, once you pick the best model, then you use the last data set to do the real evaluation. Does this make sense? Right? The, once you do the real evaluation, ideally you should never go back. Right? The problem is if you go back, you might do something just to see, can I get a better real evaluation at the end? And then you're tr training hyperparameters again. And there's even one more step where you can do this, um, and I like this visualization. Um, this is more an academic problem, but in academia, a lot of people work on the same data set. They solve benchmarks and they publish papers if they can build a better model that works better on those benchmarks. Because everybody is building on the same benchmarks, you can only publish a paper if you get better accuracy. So even if you do the, tr the TRESS training and val validation split, you only publish the best models and those are the best models on that data. So for benchmarks, what people have found is that the published, ben uh, the published models for benchmarks are usually much better. They are overfitting compared to the real performance. And again, you could hold out some data that you never give to anybody, um, but once you release that extra test data, um, the benchmark is kind of useless, right? Because or you can't accept any more submissions to the benchmark because you could overfit on this. I should really stop here. Um, what I tried to do today and um, is show you kind of the basic idea of machine learning, right? So what you should take away from today is kind of basic concepts like data frame, what's a model, what's a validation test split, why do you do that? Um, maybe understand how decision trees work and really understand how over how do you get to overfitting? How do you get to underfitting? And what are hyperparameters? How do you tune them? And the evaluation strategies, why do you split this? All right. I'm already over time. I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop the recording and hang around for questions. All right. Um, so, uh,